Get your songbooks out and find a in the pew in front of you, and we'll sing some hymns to our God this morning as we let our voices ring with his praise after he's been so good to us. Amen. Number one. Number one. Number one. Number one. We had a great Sunday school hour with Brother Mayor, and we'll continue on here. Stand together, and we'll sing this good hymn. Rejoice, the Lord is King. You get to say at the end, rejoice. Again, I say rejoice. And we got something to rejoice about. Amen. Number one, stand together, get your books open, and get your voices ready, and get your hearts in tune with God. Number one, as Brother Jim leads us. Rejoice, our Lord is King, your Lord and King adore. Rejoice, give thanks and sing, and triumph evermore. Lift up your heart, lift up your voice, rejoice again, I say. The Savior reigns, the God of truth and love. When He had purged our stains, He took His seat above. Lift up your heart, lift up your voice, rejoice again. I say.
524. 524. <clears throat> Saved by the blood. Saved by the blood of the crucified one, now ransomed from sin and a new work begun. Sing praise to the Father and praise to the Son. Saved by the blood of the crucified one. singing please be seated young people don't be seated you follow Andy and Rebecca and the twins to your class thanks for your good singing over there a group is heading with brother Johnson to Peru on Tuesday for this outreach and we'll pray for that and Pray for the crisis in Israel and those people there and the innocents, and we need to lift up Israel and, and our country stand with them. And pray for Brother Ron Jones. He is um, not doing well. Just I don't know if his death is imminent. My sister's death is imminent. Uh, she's on palliative care. So if you'd pray for her family and um, Brother Nolan not being able to be here shut in and all of our other dear shut-ins on our prayer list. Um, let's go ahead and go to the Lord in prayer. God, we are thankful for your blessings, thankful, Lord, for the Bible that instructs us and helps us. And, Lord, we were helped in Sunday school, and thank you for that. Uh, we thank you for these songs that we can sing about you, and we think about that blood, Lord Jesus, that, that just means you died for us. And you, you voluntarily died on a cross, took our sins for us because you loved us and wanted us to have re refellowship with you. Thank you for doing that for us. Thank you for Calvary. Thank you, God, for um, the promises of eternal life, Lord. We, we think of these ones, Lord, on their deathbeds. Lord, I think of my sister. Lord, I think of her family. Lord, I pray for, I pray for John and Beth and, and Marianne, Lord, as they grieve their, their mother. But Lord, we thank you for the promise of eternal life. She's saved and ready to go home. We are asking your peace there, God. We pray for Ron Jones, Lord. We, we pray for... Um, Jeff and, and Linda and Randy and the family there, Lord, is, and, and Jean, God, as she sees her l l beloved husband, Lord, just 
heading home. And Lord, we're thankful for that promise of home. And God, we are we're thankful, Lord, that you can give us a peace that passeth understanding and a comfort in our, in our needs. And thank you, Lord, for giving us the comforter to indwell us. And Lord, I pray that even as was preached in Sunday school, Lord, that you would help our desires to be equal with your plan for us. God, bless our church, Lord, as we go on for you, Lord. We sure need your help. Lord, without you, we can do nothing. We thank you for the foundation that was laid on Christ Jesus. Lord, help us to build strong on it as we continue on for you. We pray for souls to be saved. We pray for our missionaries, servant, Lord, around the world, the privilege we have of giving of our um, means and our money, Lord, so that they could go out and do this. And Lord, I pray you'd challenge our hearts to be faithful givers towards that and prayers. Lord, we do pray for Brother Paul, Lord, as he is and Susan are ministering to Susan's family this weekend and away, Lord, we thank you for the, the answer to prayer for Callum, Lord, and his little body. Lord, we do pray for Caroline, Lord, and this dreaded disease in her. You'd give Blake and Lindsay much mercy and grace, God, we pray. Lord, we pray for um, uh, Brother Johnson and this team of 20 or so that, that are be going down to Peru for outreach. And Lord, just like every place else in the world, Lord, those people need God. And I pray that you would bless, protect, and use that ministry, God, and, and help them as they, as they pass out tracts and Bibles and have evangelistic meetings and talk to people, all that they do, God, that your hand would be right in the center of it. Lord, we do pray for Israel. You told us we're supposed to pay for the peace of Jerusalem, understanding, Lord, that's a reminder to us that one day the Prince of Peace is returning, and Lord, it's going to be wonderful, but Lord, for people that aren't saved, it's going to be dreadful, and God, we do pray for those innocents there, Lord, even as is mentioned with the war in Ukraine, people are looking for hope, and Lord, we pray for folks to be saved, and God, you would, you would help in that situation. God, give our leaders of our country, God, a Wisdom, God, from on high, positive peer pressure, we pray. Now, as our church goes on for you, Lord, we ask your blessings on this service. Uh, Andy and Rebecca, Lord, as they teach the children and what happens with Sierra and the little ones, God, we are thankful for children, and we pray that we could help them to grow up in the nurture and admonition of you. We do pray for Rebecca and those twins in her womb, God. You would bless and protect them, we pray, for a healthy birth. Now, you've been so good to us. Bless our service. Brother Rue, as he preaches, God, in our hearts as we're reminded of missions and we're reminded of, of the blessings we have here in our country and the suffering in the world, God, we are asking your favor as we focus our hearts now on you. Thank you for church this morning in Christ's name. Amen. All right, Brother Rue, or Brother Rue, I keep saying Brother Rue, and Brother Mayor, Brother Mayor, um, he's been over in Ukraine about the same amount of time that Brother Paul has been in Moldova. I remember specifically, I was about, uh, how long ago was it when the first Couriers of, for Christ campaign happened in Kishnau, 20 years ago, something like that, and had the privilege to go over there. And, of course, on those campaigns, you go out on the street and you pass out flyers and invitations and gospel tracts, and this big evangelistic meeting is planned in the concert theater in Kishnau and never quite know what to expect and so everyone's invited to come to hear the gospel and you know it's in the early days of the freedom of Moldova after the Iron Curtain fell and um, people were promised if they came they get a free Bible and and hear the gospel well people came and 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 the had to sh shut the doors to the place because the whole auditorium was totally full and people were standing outside and you know Paul's kind of you know you know how Paul is kind of what are we going to do and got to figure this out now brother mayor shows up and some of these minis ministers and helpers from Ukraine and brother mayor is out there while the meeting's going on inside he's out there on the steps of that uh, theater preaching to them people out there and I remember that. What a blessing. And he's been a blessing. He's been a, a, a good minister, and we are glad to have him with us and glad to help him in his ministry through our prayers and support. So he's going to come up here. I'm going to try to get this PowerPoint ready to go, and we'll get going here. <clears throat> uh, 
I thank the Lord for the opportunity to be here, and yet it was a blessing back then. 200 and some, well, actually there were about 400 people, but not every one of them was wanting to listen, but 250 people sat there quietly and listened as we preached. They sat on the steps, these um, cement steps out of the theater that they had rented, and they listened as we preached the gospel to them. I preached, and then a couple other Ukrainians preached, and then I had a couple guys come out with some instruments, try to kind of give them some gospel hymns and things. And then God blessed where we were able to send them up there and get uh, Bibles, and then they were able to leave right before the, everybody over, I forget, 1,700? or There were about 1,700 people, I think, totaled that came to that event. And it was a great ad- blessing. I've never seen that many people when I said, you know, anybody wants to come out and pray, and like 30-some people came down to the front, out of, off the steps, and got down there and prayed with us. It was a blessing to see that. I don't, I don't really believe in a big mass prayers, but when they were all so serious, I mean, and you don't really have the chance to deal with each one individually, it was a blessing to see God do that. And I've, I've always, in a sense, been thankful to see how open they were in Moldova. When Brother Paul's there and doing that work there, it's a great thing to see that God's working in that country. But Ukraine's are na- we're neighbors, so we're right there bordering each other. And Brother Paul used to be in Prednestrovia, or Transnestria, I guess they call it in English. And that's our little neighbor squeezed between where our church is and where Brother Paul is now in Kishinev. There's a little strip of land there called Transnestria, where he used to be there in Slobodzea. And sadly to say right now, Russia's using Transnestria again. They're manipulating the world, saying, okay, Transnestria is screaming out, please deliver us, because we're being persecuted. Well, they wouldn't be persecuted, but Russia's closing the port in Odessa has created problems for them. So they're screaming out, and then Russia's right now fighting as much as they can and bombing Odessa and everywhere you can along the, the, the ports, along the, the, city, or the Black Sea, trying to take completely all the ports and get Ukraine landlocked, if they even let them exist as a country, but they're definitely trying to get them all landlocked and be able to deliver those poor 600,000 people that live in Prednestrovia, Transnestria, and that's that's their new goal right now, is to deliver those people, and that means they have to do that. They have to get all the cities and all the southern part of the country of Ukraine to be able to keep them, make an access to get those people freed up. It's all uh, everything that Russia does is also always propaganda, and that's another propaganda step. But I'm thankful that uh, the Lord brought us here, and uh, yeah, if you can turn the lights off, that'll help a lot. But I'm um, thankful for my wife, Oksana, and uh, the two children the Lord blessed us with, David and Elizabeth. Grateful that God gave us two great kids. And David, we thank the Lord he saved him last, last fall. And we're thankful. He's 19 now, and uh, right now he's actually over in Ukraine. He got over there April 8th. Elizabeth is studying uh, in C- at Cedarville University and hoping to finish up this next December and then get her master's so she can go back and help some of these kids that are studying or that are suffering from the trauma there of you know, this war. But the Lord put us in southern Ukraine right along that border where Brother Paul used to be working. He was about 20 miles from us the way the crow flied. But we're thankful for how God put us right there on that border and we were able to establish Lakeside Baptist Church. And Lakeside Baptist Church is doing a great job right now, continuing on doing the work that we got them, got them started doing. And we're grateful that uh, Brother Slavic, he's the pastor we put in our place instead of me. And he's doing a great job continuing all the ministries. Brother Rue came over and helped us to do the ordination with him. And we're thankful that uh, he's doing a great work of continuing everything. And at last, during the war, they have had six souls get baptized. And the fellow on the right there is one of them. He read our, bi- our library for 20 years and finally got saved. The fellow there on the right here got baptized last year. And for 17 and a half years, his wife prayed for him. So remember, sisters, the Lord can do it. He will and he can. And brothers, if you're praying for your wife, keep on praying. Lord bless. They continue to do vacation Bible schools, not just once a year, but they do them as often as they can and do some kind of an outreach to try to reach out to the kids. But we're thankful for the joint institute we did with Brother Chris Rue and how God blessed and used that. We were able to see some, some good fellows get out of that institute. One of them is Brother Nick and his wife. They're about two hours north of us. They've got a good work going in a village there. And right now he's actually in Romania and the young fellows that are there in his place are preaching in his stead. They're doing a good job. This other fellow here, Brother Sergei, he's actually over there where Brother Hamilton used to be in Prednestrovia, working there. And this is our missionary from Siberia. He had to come back from Siberia, and he's also in Prednestrovia over there, Transnestria, where Brother, uh, his, actually his son is teaching, and Brother, it's La Bozea, teaching the youth there. 
at uh, the church there where Brother Paul originally established there. He's working with Brother Victor and teaching the youth. We're thankful for how God's using them. They turned over their work in Altai and moved, to U- moved back from there because Russia was persecuting them. So they had to come back and start working in Moldova. But we're grateful that God's blessed us with uh, the ability to print our own magnetic scriptures over there because a lot of people use them in their homes. They'll use them on their gates. They'll put them on their refrigerators. But uh, our, of course, main goal is to get them on people's vehicles, and we're thankful for how they do get read. This is the guy who's supposed to put the gas in. He's just reading, reading away, and we're grateful that God does that. But we even had a, a chaplain that was able to put the, uh, the scriptures on the outside of this military ambulance, and we're grateful for that. He didn't just put them on the outside. He put this one right above the, where they're sitting on the stretcher. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. God can and God will. Thankful for the church that continue to pass out every year, eight and a half thousand calendars and tracks to different villages around us. There's like 15 different villages that they go to every year and try to give them to each of all the people there. Also, Couriers for Christ up in Wisconsin gives us Bibles so we can send those out. We usually have about $5,000 worth of Bibles every year that we're sending out all over the country. This year, actually, they had a church in Canada that gave $15,000 for Bibles to send out Ukrainian Bibles all over. The Lord supplies us with other literature that we send out because we have a big correspondence ministry. My partner, Paul Gray, oversees that. And these are our testimonial tracks. You'll see a couple of these on the back table. Please take them with you and read them. We'll talk about them during the preaching hour. But I'm grateful for fellows like this. There's a lot of people that have started writing to us and saying, please send us something so we can go witness to people. We send him a magnet. We also send him out some New Testaments and our, even our gospel bag there. It's a little bag that has the gospel on both sides of it, and they put the literature in there and pass it out as they pass out food. have a lot of street preachers that have been writing to us and saying, please send us something so we can get out there and uh, pass the gospel out as we go. This is a young fellow who's committed himself to being a, a full-time evangelist. Brother Paul sends him all kinds of... Uh, his commentaries on the, the New Testament books, and he does a really good job of getting all the literature that he gets out all over the country. We're grateful for him. There's many others like him that have gone out this last year, when the last year and a half, when the war, two years actually since the war began, and they've been going out to different places and putting up, uh, diff- having different meetings. This one here is a preacher that goes out every week and puts up this tent and answers people's questions, has New Testaments and Gospels and literature that we supply him with, and he answers the questions, gives them the Gospel, and he's just doing a great job. But there's a lot of people now that are hungry, like this lady here. When she got this Bible, she just started devouring it right there on the sidewalk. Just grateful that God's got people out there who want to get the Word out, just a matter of getting the Word in their hands. And we're just grateful that God's using those ministries to reach out to the lost. That's become my new ministry as an evangelist. I've gone out to many different places all over the country, going out and trying to reach those souls that are out there, especially the churches that are, there's large churches that have no burden for how to actually reach out to the lost around them. And they invite me to come and teach them and spend a week there and give them seminars. And I'm going around and teaching them how to do their own personal testimony using testimonial tracks. We have nine different testimonial tracks. These are two of them that you can take with you and read them. And maybe you should put your testimony in, in print. But we also teach them how to use different methods. One's called the three circles, how to explain the gospel to somebody using any simple little thing that you have. And also I use something called the evangifold. You can grab one of these on your way out too. They're back on the table. This little evangifold is a great little tool to be able to explain the gospel to somebody and keep their mind focused on what you're talking about. The the blessing of it is when they, in our day and time, and especially people are connected to videos and movies and television, when they see it and they hear it, they put it, the two together and they, they stay focused so much better. Had a 92-year-old fella get saved on this picture here when I told him God's waiting for him. He got out of bed and asked the Lord to save him. And I'm glad God can. But the uh, thing is, is just getting the gospel out there and explaining the gospel. This is one of the tools I give people so they can go out and explain the gospel. And it gives them confidence that can, they, people will follow through what they're listening as they explain the gospel. I've used it with different groups, large churches even. But uh, we've go to a lot of different places and go out and Witness the people. These two ladies got saved that day. This was actually the preacher's neighbor in the city of Mariupol, which doesn't exist almost anymore. There were 90-some thousand people that died in that city. It was the biggest bombing attack that they did. This lady's also from Mariupol. She got saved there. We're grateful for that 92-year-old fellow who got saved in that town, too. We're grateful that God blessed, and there's a lot of people that have burdens for their relatives. This is a uh, and grandma that the fella said, we got to go visit my grandma. She had a stroke and we got to, got to reach her before she died. Thankful she got saved. And I have a great opportunity to be able to go out to different churches and go out one-on-one and teach them how to do visits. The best time, of course, for them is the winter 
The people can't really do anything, so they're sitting at home, and you can go in there and teach them and explain the gospel. And I'm glad that once the young fellows get a hold of it, they continue doing it without me. And that's what's important is being able to teach those so that they can continue to teach others and continue to use the gospel. Just grateful for how God uses the tools. This is the Evangel Cube, but a big version of it. And we're grateful we can get the gospel out there to people and give them the truth. And I'm, right now I'm learning Ukrainian, so I can do it even more effectively in Ukrainian. But I'm thankful that God's blessed in this war even. Even though it's a terrible thing, God's using it to be able to open up hearts and doors to people who are now seek, seeking the Lord Jesus Christ. You can see Transnistria over there in Moldova. That's where Brother Paul used to be. But this is what Russia has been doing for years. They have these little sections of countries that they possess and occupy, and they kind of make them their own eventually. And that's what they're doing now, trying to invade Ukraine, go further and take more and more land. The original invasion was in the beginning of February 2022, and then they backed out because they realized they'd spread themselves too thin. They backed out from the capital city and came in from the east, trying to push and get as much land as they could. And now they're heavily bombing up there in the north, the city of Kharkov, trying to take that over, and the south. They're trying to get the Odessa. They're just pushing as hard as they can to take all these big cities, especially the port cities, because they call this section down here on the bottom called New Russia. And they've been wanting it to become theirs for years. And sadly to say, this is what they're producing. They're coming in there and they're just destroying so many things. It's, it's amazing when you look at the villages that they've, the army, Russian, Ukrainian army has not even been there, but the villages, every house has got damage. And it's just because they're bombing everything, not just uh, military projects, objects. One village, this is their, their big, big five-story building. The middle of it's just gone. It's crazy. But the distress that it caused people and how many people, it, lives it affected is unbelievable. There were 14 million souls that got displaced, had to leave their homes because of the war or because they were so scared of all the bombing to get out. And the 6 million left the country. And um, there's still more that will, if this gets war gets worse and it isn't getting any better, there's still more that will probably leave soon. But uh, a lot of it, the people that could leave was the women, women with their kids. They wanted to get their kids out so their kids wouldn't have to hear all the shelling and the bombing. And um, the, the sad thing is, is if they left without their husband, they basically are separated for all these two years almost. Some have come back for that reason. But we went over immediately to go over and print literature and take aid over there to what we could in our bags. We went over and printed books like this one here, which is called Why is God Silent? And God isn't stopping this war because he's using it to help people to wake up to think about salvation. We printed literature there in Romania to be able to send all over the country. And we were grateful that God blessed. And back in Odessa, they began to actually get paper again. And they were able to start printing our gospel tracts there, different chick tracts. And we were able to, to stake those and spread them all over Europe to these places where people were actually coming through refugee centers to, to get literature and then go on. And we packed up a lot of different boxes of literature to be able to send out to different places in Europe. All these countries on the right here asked us for literature. Brother Moore and others over in Ireland, so we could send them literature and they could actually pass it out to different places or to those refugee centers where people were being housed. Also went to the train stations and bus stations in Pol Poland mainly, where there were a lot of them coming through there. And my wife helped me actually to fill up our car four times the summer of 22. And we sent that all over Poland, Portugal, and places like that, and even Ireland. We sent that all over different places. And then we actually made a trip to France and Germany and all different places trying to get the gospel to those people. Went down to Bulgaria, worked with our friends there, missionaries. They were actually doing a great outreach trying to reach people, but they didn't have literature. So we helped them get literature printed and get it down in there and put it in these care packages that they were actually sending in with soldiers, but also taking to all these centers where the people were located and they were being housed. So we were able to go in there and give them food and help them. And as we did that, and they were, they were supplying a lot of money for this food and stuff, it just opened up doors so we could get the gospel to these groups. Mainly it was a great opportunity to be able to give the gospel to the, the mothers and the kids. And it was a great thing because of the fact that they now understand what God's done for them and what they have to do to please God is believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Thankful that God blessed and this is open doors is great. It's a lot bigger than people realize because people are finally seeking the Lord now. So pray that God had used the New Testaments. We're thankful that the Gideons have opened up their storages and said, use as many as you want and anybody can get them and pass them out. This is a woman who got saved in uh, Poland. 
She said, a week, two weeks later when we visited her again, she said, I'm so thankful you came because I wouldn't have known I was going to heaven if you wouldn't have shown up. We're thankful that God uh, blessed in a lot of churches now, got active and got serious. This is some of the God's army that I work with over there. I'm thankful for these young fellows. But I wonder if you're in God's army. Are you actively serving or are you just sitting on the sidelines considering yourself to be a reservist? This young fellow in the middle there, his name's Michael. I've been working with him now since 2016 as I began working with other churches and going around and teaching churches. We gave him a van and he went out and took uh, food in to people. And then he would also bring out refugees, those that were, wanted to flee to get safety. And these are some actually Indian students from the city of Kharkov that wanted to get out as the war was getting worse and worse and approaching their city. There's a lot of other guys in there that I've been helping. This fellow up in Sumska Oblast, he's a really good preacher. The young fellow on the left, his name is Eugene, and he's been supplying different churches with uh, aid all along during this whole time. And using that as an evangelistic tool, they would give it to churches, and the churches would call a big meeting in their town and invite people to come to hear the gospel. After they heard the gospel, then they could give them food and not just give it as humanitarian aid, but call it Christian aid. God caring for their souls, and the goodness of God is what leads people to repentance, and we're thankful for that. This old grandma was thankful that somebody brought her food, but also that they gave her a New Testament. And we're glad that there's <clears throat> souls now that are seeking the Lord. There's a lot of people, there's a preacher up in Chernigov who wants us to come and work with him. I was in that Sumsky Oblast, the one you just saw a minute ago. I was there last all during the summer, but this is a fellow who wants me to come up there and work with him. Their town was without any power, without any gas, without anything. And so he put together a stove and started fixing food for all of his neighbors in his whole town. Basically, all these neighbors who said they would never come to his church, praise God, now they're coming because they saw God blessing and helping through him, and now they're willing to listen to him. We're grateful for God using people like that who devoted themselves, didn't flee the country. There were a lot that fled for different reasons, but a lot of them are still there faithfully serving the Lord. He was even sending his son out to Germany and places like that to bring back food so he could pass out food and give the gospel out with the food. Just grateful that God's using fellows like this to get the truth out. This is what happened to his building. He has another building in the city, a mission, they calls it, where he's actually got 70 people were meeting there. Now there's 200 coming, and we're thankful for that. But it's a sad situation, the destruction that's been happening over, all over the country. This fella here is actually my brother-in-law on the left. That's Oksana's brother, Slavic, and he's been working with different groups, military, and helping them. He brought these vans in for him, but also he's been mainly doing uh, Christian camps. Our boys, uh, Elizabeth and David, have both been working with him a lot. They helped him the first year in Romania, and then last year in Ukraine, and this year they're both going over to work at the camps in Odessa. And they've also been even supplying wood for people because Russia's main goal has been to try to make them suffer as much as they could. And year before last, he really bombed all the uh, factories that were made, all the electrical plants. So people had to rely on wood for their heat. And um, <clears throat> this year he did it again. He just recently bombed one of the biggest plants that they have there, power plant for $230 million worth of damage. It's really sad to see such a thing. And it's leaving most of the city, the capital city, without any electricity. So pray for the Lord to use the gospel with these souls. It's a great thing to see God deliver and protect. This is a missile came in and it didn't blow up the car. I mean, it should have. It shouldn't have been a dud, but God can supply and protect. But there's a lot of situations like that. There's even miracles like this. A uh, young kid being advertised by CNN reading a chick tract on the Polish border. God can do anything. But pray that God would use the literature that people have now in their hands because there are souls getting saved and we want to see a great harvest of souls as a result of this whole thing. It's just really a sad situation, but God can use it. And I pray that you're using your opportunities and you're going forth and weeping, bearing precious seed so you can doubtless come again with rejoicing and bring your sheaves with you to heaven. That's the only thing we're going to take there with us besides what we already put up there in our treasures but I hope you're pointing people to the way, the truth, and the life. There's no other way they're going to get saved unless you and I get serious. So we got to get our feet busy, our feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace so we can get the truth out to people because without us, <clears throat> the JWs will find them or some other cult, but uh, will they get the truth? The question is, do we realize how important the truth is? <clears throat> Colossians chapter 1 verse 12, not Colossians, Philippians 1 verse 12, tells us something that Paul talked about 
in uh, his day and time. He was in a ministry, prison ministry at the time. And um, he's writing about how we should rejoice in the Lord evermore, right? <clears throat> how many of us would be like him, but we would be the ones having that sorrow upon sorrow, which he said would have happened if the brother would have died while he was there in prison. But we're thankful that God can use even a situation. When Paul was in prison, that's when he wrote the thir- some of the 13 um, epistles that we have that Paul wrote. Some of them were his prison epistles. And we're thankful that there's passages like this in uh, Philippians 1, verse 12. He tells us basically why bad situations happen. They don't always happen like we think, you know, God's punishing us or something like that. But God uses them. God has a purpose for everything that he does. And that's what we need to do is not look so much as who did what or what, what happened here. What is God doing? We get so focused on our little trial. We get so focused on our piece of the puzzle, we forget to pull back and look at the whole picture. What's God really doing? What's his purpose in this whole world down here that he has and why he sent Christ and everything else? But we're going to talk about that. But verse 12 says, I would ye should understand, brethren, that the things which happened unto me have fallen out rather under the furtherance of the gospel. The things that happened in Ukraine, things that are happening in Israel, are happening rather under the furtherance of the gospel. There's a lot more people in Israel now <clears throat> willing to take gospel tracts. Why? Because they're thinking about it. And it's working in their hearts. When we were there, we stuffed a lot of uh, gospels, uh, gospel tracts in mailboxes. They were in Russian, typically. And some of them were in Hebrew. But as we did that, I thought, why are we doing this? But then I realized who we're dealing with. We're dealing with Jews. A Jewish person that if they get this in their hand, they're not very happy. We found that down in Miami when we were there. We gave it to a man in the parking lot. And um, 15 minutes later, he was cussing us out. He was a Jewish guy with Jewish writings all over his vehicle. He was mad. He even told my wife she should divorce me because, you know, I guess he thought she was Jewish and I was uh, American. I don't know what it was, but he told her she should leave me because I was such an adamant preacher of the gospel. But it's amazing if you put this in their hand, they're going to think, oh, who gave it to me? They're going to think about you. And in, uh, in Israel, that's a bad thing because they're a Christian, giving something to a Jew, you're trying to proselytize them. But um, <clears throat> when you put it in their mailbox, they don't know who put it there. And they pull it out of there, and they're going to look at it in the privacy of their own time. And that's a whole bit different situation. I realize in Israel, that's more effective than actually trying to give it into their hands. And you can get a whole lot more in those mailboxes that way, too. And it worked out really, I think, better in a lot of ways. Although we did, when there was Russian speakers, we went and actually gave them to them personally, put them in the handles of their cars. And we had a, had a woman that I gave her son a gospel tract in Russian. She goes, but he can't understand that. They've been there for 30-some years, and he grew up and went to the Hebrew schools. So praise God, I had a Hebrew one. I gave it to him, and he was happy, and she was happy, because she got to read the Russian one. He got to read the Hebrew one. But you think about that. She wanted it. She wasn't mad that I put it in their door handle. She was thankful that they got something. And even though it talks about Jesus, it's not... It's a matter of us getting the gospel in their hands, getting it in their hearts so they can understand the choice they have to make. Do you and I realize that they're going to make a choice? And that choice is based upon what they know and what they've seen. That's why Paul or John, John says, I've, I've wrote down what I heard and seen. I mean, well, the things that I actually saw with my hands and my eyes and I felt, that's what First John starts out with. And Luke even says, you know, that he, he put everything in his gospel, that, you know, he was an eyewitness account. We need to tell them what really God did in our lives because that's what they need in their lives. And they'll understand it if we actually share it and tell it to them. But so often we're afraid. Afraid of what? Afraid of how they're going to react? Sadly to say, yeah, but why? Turn with me to Isaiah 51 and verse 6. Basically, Paul's said that, you know, the things that happened unto him worked out better. I mean, even though he was in a bad situation, people were doing bad things, you know, people were even preaching for the wrong reason so that Paul would give him more, a stronger prison sentence. But God used it for his good. God can. That's why we printed that little booklet, Why is God Silent? It's part of a book called Jesus, Our Destiny in English. Um, It's a very good book written by a German fellow, and we use it over there intensively. Besides the Bible, it's one of the most effective books we've ever seen as far as people understanding and, and getting saved. 
It was answers to young people's questions back in the 1950s. A uh, fellow during World War II was answering their questions, and one day he fell asleep at the train station, never woke back up. But God used this fellow in a mighty way. He wrote a, they wrote a book about his answers, and it's the most effective book as far as souls getting saved in Ukraine, Russia, and Germany. And it's a Lutheran fellow. We said we found one word in there we would have changed, and a whole book. But he was a Lutheran deitist or something like that. He really believed in God and really trusted in salvation by grace and faith. And he was really a serious fellow. But <clears throat> I want you to look at this verse, verse 6. I want you to look at it carefully because it's a very interesting verse. We're going to read verses one through, or 6 through 8, but then we'll go back to verse 6. Lift up your eyes to the heavens and look upon the earth beneath. For the heavens shall vanish away like smoke, and the earth shall wax old like a garment. And they that dwell therein shall die in like manner. But my salvation be, shall be forever, and my righteousness shall not be abolished. Hearken unto me, ye that know righteousness. That's us, isn't it? The people in whose heart is my law. Fear, not, fear ye not the reproach of men. There's, there goes, what? Fear, right? We shouldn't be. God said don't. Don't fear the reproach of men. Neither be ye afraid of their revilings, even if they chew you out. Don't be afraid of that. Don't worry about it. Don't pay attention. God's purpose is for us to get the gospel out and not worry about their reaction. We are supposed to speak the truth in love, but we're supposed to do it with a f uh, boldness and firmness so we, we let them know the truth because that's what they need to hear. And he says, For the moth shall eat them up like a garment, and the worm shall eat them like wool. But my righteousness shall be forever, and my salvation from generation to generation. Awake, awake. We need to wake up sometimes, don't we? Realize what God says, and he's serious in all that he says. But verse 6, he tells us what we should be looking at. So often our eyes are upon what we see and feel and touch. We think about the job we have, the uh, car we have, the house we have, all these material things, because that's what we can feel and touch. But that's the same thing that the Gentiles think about and seek, isn't it? They're worried about having a real nice car, real nice career, all those things so they can, you know, be successful. But is that God's success? What is God's success? Getting our eyes on His things, not those things. He says, not to seek the things that the Gentiles are seeking after, but He said, seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. And all those other things you need, he said, they'll be added unto you. But we're seeking those things so often and forgetting about these things, the most important things. That's why he tries to get us, our eyes refocused. And that's why the bottom, the, the bottom half of this verse says, the heavens shall vanish away like smoke. The heavens are temporal. Think about that. The heavens going to burn up. And he says there that the, <clears throat> uh, the earth shall wax old like a garment. Even all these physical things we're looking at for down here, they're all going to vanish away. And he says, and they that dwell therein shall die. In like manner, everybody's dying. It's appointed to men once to die. The question is, after this, the judgment. Are they going to be in the judgment, the resurrection that's going to be to life? Or are they going to be in the resurrection and the condemnation? And that depends on the choice they make. And that choice depends on what we tell them whether we give them the gospel, the truth or not. But let's go on. Here he says, but those things are all temporal. Everything you see, even the, the lives and the, the people, their, their, their bodies are going to die, but their souls not. Why? He says, because my salvation shall be forever, and my righteousness shall not be abolished. Those are the only things that are eternal. God's salvation and his righteousness. I'm thankful if you have God's salvation, and you have Christ's righteousness, because that's what will get you to heaven. But let's go back up to the verse, first part of the verse there. He tells us what we should get our eyes upon, and so often our eyes aren't on the right thing. He says, lift up your eyes to the heavens, and he doesn't just say, look, look up there. He says, lift them up. Get them up there, so you can actually get his perspective. And now, from up there, look down upon the earth. And then you'll see how temporal everything around you is. You'll see that the earth, the heavens, the people, they're all dying. They're all perishing. Nothing down here is permanent except his righteousness and his salvation. So what's God's goal? To get the salvation. 
the gospel, the saving gospel to all souls. We got to get our eyes on what's important for him. There's a couple places in the Bible where it says to lift up our eyes. We're going to talk about a couple of them right now. Lift up your eyes to the heavens and look upon the earth beneath. And we're not just talking about what does God see, a bunch of grasshoppers running around down here on the earth or ants like, you know, we would be really small in his sight. But what is he looking at when he sees us? What is he looking at when he sees them? We know him and he knows us and we're his children. But he's looking at us as his children that are supposed to be obedient children, that are supposed to obey his command. And he said, us, told us to go. Jesus said, as my father said, and you. But how many of us are going? We call it the Great Commission. Why is it a Great Commission? Because there's a great harvest. He said the harvest is great. Pray, therefore, the Lord of the harvest that he will do what? Send forth. Where is he going to send them forth from? Right here. From among us. Send forth laborers into his harvest. We have a song in Russian. It's kind of an unusual song, but it says, there's nobody's backs out there wanting to labor in the fields. We don't want to be out there being those manual laborers working in the fields, but the Lord told us to go. Remember he told the two sons? The one said, yeah, I'll go. And he didn't go. The other one said, no, I'm not going to go, but he repented, and he went. Which one pleased him? I believe he would have wanted both of them to say yes and both to go, but at least the one didn't want to go at first, but he got serious, and he went and fulfilled the will of his father. And what are we doing? Are we doing that, which we can and should be doing? Lift up your eyes, he said, up to the heavens, and look upon the earth beneath. Why? For everything that you see, all these people are going to die. And where are they going to be? Where are they going to end up for eternity? Depends on the choice they make, right? They make no choice. Well, they're already by default going to go to hell because their sins separate them from God. And they're going to end up in hell, even though Christ, the Savior, died for the sins of all men. All of them are dead in their trespasses and sins. But you and I, who are made alive, what are we doing about the fact that they're dying and going to hell? Jesus said the, the way is broad. And many people go in there, what, to destruction. But he said there is a narrow way, right, that leads to life. But he said what? Few there be that find it. Huh. You have to find this one. Everybody's on that one, but they need to find the other path. One of my favorite chick tracks is one that's called The Long Trip. Why? Because it's got a picture of what you and I should be doing. On that long trip through this guy's life, he's born as a baby, he's going through life all of a sudden, he's married, he's got kids, and he meets this guy with a sign about the good news. This guy who's telling him the truth about how to be saved. His wife, his kids get saved. He believes the devil, his friend, they're telling him, yeah, you got time. You're going to live to 70. And then he, at the end of the tract, he dies at 62, and his friend takes off his mask and laughs at him, says, I lied to you, it was the devil. The devil lies to everybody, he tells them they got time. He even tells them that, yeah, you need the gospel, but later. Not now. But you know what? Most people don't even get that much knowledge because there's very few Christians out there anymore. Telling them the truth. Aren't there? When was the last time you were used of God to tell somebody the gospel? I'm not just saying stood out there on the corner with a, with a sign. That's great. It is good. But most of them don't really want to see that anyway. They're not paying much attention. I'm not saying we shouldn't do it, but there's very few. But there are some. We'll catch with that. There's different methods. Remember Peter? He was told to cast out the nets in Luke chapter 5. But he only cast out one net, and the net started to break, and he lost a lot of the fish. If they'd done both nets, he'd have caught them all. He wouldn't have lost any. But oftentimes we're missing a lot of fish because we're not doing all that we can, using every method that God shows us. I mean, sometimes standing out there in the corner, we'll catch a fish. Another one will be going and knocking on their door. Another one will be just coming up to them and giving them a gospel tract, coming up to them and telling them the truth. This is what God used to change my life. Amen. When you tell them that, they take it differently. I've had people at different hotels say, really? I hope it changes my life too. I've had other people say, I'm going to read it then. 
because I, I said that this is powerful. I didn't just say this a piece of paper about Jesus. I used to just say this is very interesting. It's from the Bible, but it's interesting to me. It's not interesting to them because they don't read the Bible and they don't care about the Bible. But when they realize this is something, the power of the gospel that's in there that can change their life, then it makes them think about how they can get a changed life because of the gospel that's in there. It doesn't have to be that tracked. That's actually my partner's testimony, Paul Gray, the former Catholic, just like me, got saved in, a, in my home church. His, actually, his brother is one of the four guys that helped me get saved. I got saved not because the preacher was a great preacher. I got saved because between Sunday school and preaching hour, about a month in a, a, month in a row, I don't know how long it took, but four different brothers in my church shared the gospel with me, shared their testimony, how they got saved. His brother, Paul's brother, shared Ephesians 2, 8, 9. If being a former Catholic and me being a former Catholic, it was really what I needed. And the other three former Catholics that were there also, they each shared different things. One guy, Romans, 6, uh, Romans 10, 13, and 10, 9 and 10. I remember just different things from different guys. And then when God told me at home, he said, repent or you're going to perish. It wasn't much of a choice. I understood. I needed to repent or I was going to die and go to hell. So I repented and asked the Lord to save me there at my home all by myself. And I ended up going back to the church, of course. But you know what? We don't realize how many people God can save out there if we'll get them to the Savior. They might not end up here. We hope they will. And you should be following up if you can. But, you know, we need to just get the gospel out there. They've even talked about tracks that somebody got and just dropped it on the parking lot and it rolled across the parking lot. Somebody else picked it up who wanted it and actually got saved from it. Our son got saved because Oksana gave him three tracks to to read. She gave him three tracks about, um, we're, we're trying to work with a woman down in, a, in Cincinnati who's a Muslim, and so we, she gave him um, three chick tracks that were all for Muslims and said, read these. Tell me which one would be the best one to give to her. She knew, you know, he's got a really good analytical mind. He can actually read it. He'll figure it out. Well, he read them, and praise God, at the end he realized, I never have really prayed that prayer from my heart. And he got saved last fall. I thank God for tracks. I mean, it's He'd read probably 150, had a shoebox full of these at every church we went to on deputation over the you know, 30 years we've been doing this. So he'd, he'd read them, but it's just one time, just God working. Of course, that took prayer, a lot of prayer. But think about it. Are we doing what we can? Ephesians 1, 13. I want you to just go through this one real quick because I want you just to realize what it takes for somebody to get saved, what it took for you to get saved. Ephesians 1.13 is a clear example of what has to happen for us to start trusting in Christ like those Jews trusted in Christ that heard the gospel before us. Verse 12 says that. Um, <clears throat> verse 13 says, In whom ye, talking about those Gentiles in Ephesus, ye also trusted after that ye heard the word of truth. Okay, these Gentiles in Ephesus started trusting in Jesus Christ after, after they heard the word of truth. They didn't just start trusting in Christ because they were brought up or baptized in a Catholic or an Orthodox or some other church. After they heard the word of truth, the gospel of, their, of your salvation, in whom, also af, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance, which is the one that gives us the power to witness. But think about this. It was a process. They trusted in Christ after they heard the word of truth. And the word of truth contained the gospel of their salvation. They heard that word of truth, and in that was the gospel. And they heard about Christ and what he did for them. And they trusted in Christ. They believed on him. And then they were sealed with the Holy, Holy Spirit of promise. But to think about the fact that somebody had to give them the word of truth. The JWs aren't going to. They're not going to understand it themselves. Remember the, Ephesian, or the Ethiopian eunuch? He said, how can I understand this except some man guide me? Give them the Gospel of John, they might get it. If they're really diligent and really seeking to find that narrow path. But most of them aren't. But if somebody guides them. The Ethiopian unit got saved. And how many others could get saved and would get saved if we gave them the word of truth, the gospel of our salvation, so it can be the gospel of their salvation? 
That's what we're here for, to share and give them the truth so that they can get saved. My ministry has become one where I go out and teach others what I'm teaching you today, in a sense, but not just from these passages. But I give seminars all over now in different places in Ukraine because they really want to know how to be able to more effectively reach people. And it's a great thing. And if we'll get serious, we can, God can use us. When he said, he that goeth forth bearing precious seed shall, doubtly, but I also forgot, he that goeth forth weeping, bearing precious seed, shall, doubtless, come again with rejoicing. You're going to doubtless come again. If you go, God will bless. Why? That's what he wants to happen. That's what he wants us to be doing. He doesn't have a different plan. He didn't change his plan because everybody got more materialistic. Everybody's sitting on their phones. Doesn't mean we have to change the plan. We can, we can use the internet and things like that if you want to. God does use that if people are serious, but more people get heresies off of there than they should. But, you know, you and I can be out there getting the word of truth to people, and that's what we're here for. Amen? Okay, I'm thank, I thought you were sleeping. <clears throat> Praise God. Think about this. This is what's God's purpose. He wants all of them to trust in Christ, and they, we also trust in Christ after that we heard the word of truth, the gospel of our salvation, in whom also after that we believed, we heard it, we trusted in him, we believed on him, and we were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. Now, what's the Holy Spirit of promise doing in you? Is he doing anything? Read chapter 3, verse 20. Chapter 3, flip over, Ephesians 3.20. This is what God wants to do. He's got his church for a purpose. Verse 21 tells us that this is through the church God's working, okay? But verse 20 says, Now unto him, unto God, that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we could ask or think. How much more? A little bit more, right? Exceeding abundantly. We limit God by how much we're asking for and how much we're thinking he can do. We have a very finite mind, and we think finitely. We need to think outside the bounds and think God is able to do so much more if he had me 100% instead of how much percent do we give him? How much of us is dedicated, devoted, following Christ? He says here, he says he's able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. Where's that power coming from? He said, ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me. Are we? Are we witnessing? Are we testifying? Grab one of these on your way out. It's a great little tool. There's a little tutorial. I've got a, little, a couple booklets back there, too, with the instructions. Of course, they don't use the King James, but that's a sad thing. But we can use what God's given us. And I can actually give you a PDF if you want to. I don't have it on. I haven't printed it out yet. I just got it the other day in the instructions. And you know, I got it in English or Russian. I don't remember. I'll have to figure that out. But anyway, you can use this little tool and people will listen to you. They'll listen to the gospel all the way through. And you'll be amazed how well they'll listen, especially if you get them involved at the beginning and ask them, what do you need? How can you get forgiveness from God? And if you ask them that question and they give you their foolish answer, well, if I'm good enough... Then you open it up and you say, okay, if you can be good enough, then why did that have to happen? Why did Jesus have to die on that cross? And you, you got them hooked now. They're going to listen to you because now you're showing them the answer to their question, how they can truly get their sins forgiven through the blood of Christ and get cleansed through the blood of Christ. It works really well. I, I'm going to put a... I put a tutorial for it together in Russian. I'll have to maybe do one in English sometime because I don't really like theirs very well, but it's not bad. It's not bad. If you go on this website here, E3 Resources, they've got a little tutorial there, and it's, it's clear. It's clear. But think about what God wants you and me to be focused on right now. Look with me to Colossians 3, verse 1. This is talking about a Christian that knows he's saved, and he knows that Christ died for him, Rose again, and now we're risen together with him, right? We were crucified with Christ, and now we've risen again to live for him. If you then be risen with Christ, chapter 3, Colossians, verse 1, what should be, you be doing? Seek those things which are above. Where should your eyes be upon? The things that are going on up there in heaven. What's God doing? Where are you supposed to be looking? Where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. For ye are dead, 
and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. Think about this. Our life is Christ, not my life, his life. This is his life. This is time for him to live, not time for me to live. I had my life. I lived for sin. Now I have a new life. I live for him. And if we'll get full of the love of God and appreciate how much he forgave us for that life of sin, we'll start loving God like we should and be willing and ready to do whatever he asks us to do. And we won't love sin. Yes, it's a battle. It's never, the battle doesn't end until you die. But when you're close to the Lord, when you're filled, you're the love, your heart is full of the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts through the Holy Ghost is given unto us, right? That God puts his love in our hearts so we will love him now. God changes us completely. So now we can love him and we should love him and we should follow him and obey him now because we want to please him. Okay, but if you are risen with Christ, then he said, seek those things which are above. Think about what's going on in heaven. If you were in heaven right now, what would you see? God just sitting up there twiddling his thumbs waiting for the next prayer? No. What is God? When does God get happy? When does he rejoice? The Bible says there's joy in the presence of the angels. Where are the angels? Around God's throne, right? There's joy in the presence of those angels. Who's rejoicing? When one sinner rejoices. God's rejoicing. And Jesus went to the cross, and it says he despised the shame, but he looked at the joy that was set before him. The joy after that cross. He was obedient unto death, even the death of the cross, which was a, a shame, which was a, a terrible event. Why? The bit, most important event in all of history, where Jesus Christ, the Son of God, was made sin for us to take the wrath of God and have the wrath of God poured out upon him by his Father. That's why he said, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Because he had to endure the wrath of God that you and I deserve so God could take the wrath of God away from sinners. And they could have the Son. He that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son shall not see life. Why? Because the wrath of God still abides on him. And Christ sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world, right? And he says, he that hath the Son, or he that believeth on the Son is not condemned. He that believeth not is condemned already. Why? Because he hath not believed in that name of the only begotten Son of God. Think about it. God gave his Son, crucified him on that cross, he punished him for you and for me. And people are going to go to hell. Why? Because they don't value that. They don't thank God for it. They don't trust God. They don't turn to God and ask him for forgiveness, realizing that was done for them so they could get forgiveness. God's not an unmerciful God. He's a very merciful God. Right now he's sitting where? Up in heaven at the mercy seat, waiting to show mercy to sinners. He's wanting them to come. And Christ is sitting at his right hand waiting to intercede. When are they going to come? God's long-suffering, putting up with them, putting up with their sins. He doesn't want to punish them so they die and go to hell. He's waiting for the day when they're going to come. And Jesus is waiting. He's sitting there waiting. When can I use my advocate authority and intercede for the sinners that are coming to get saved? He's able to save unto the uttermost all that come unto God by him, right? He said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. God's waiting. He says he, he's suffered on the cross. Why? To bring us to God through those sufferings. But are you and I getting those sinners to Christ? So they'll come, not to the altar here, but they'll come to Christ. You don't have to make a Baptist. God can do that after they're saved. But you and I got to get them saved. We, gotta, we can't save them, but we can get them to the Savior. And if we don't see that that's what's going on in heaven, Get your eyes up there where Christ is sitting there right on, waiting for those souls to come. When are we going to get them there? Remember, Jesus took and sent his disciples into Sychar in John chapter 4. He sent them into, the, into Sychar, and it says they went away to buy meat. They went away to buy bread. Now, when they get there to Sychar, the disciples, they were in a Samaritan city, right? They didn't like the Samaritans, right? They were strangers. Even Jesus called them strangers. But, you know, they, they come, he comes there to Sychar, and he's out there on the, at the well, witnessing to the woman, and the woman's listening to the gospel. But his disciples are doing what? What are the disciples doing? You're a disciple, right? What are you doing? 
Are you out in this world sowing the seed? Paul said, when I came through in Corinth, he said, I sowed. Apollos came through and he watered and God gave an increase. But Jesus sent his disciples into Sychar. And they went in there and they found somebody who had some good bread. So they got some bread. And I imagine somebody else had some fish because they always ate bread and fish, didn't they? So they come back with a good lunch. And they come to Jesus and Jesus says, what? That's what you brought back? He says, I have meat to eat that you know not of. That's not what I'm here for. Is that what we're here for? Is that all we're here for? Like I said in the beginning, Jesus said this. He said, don't seek what the Gentiles are seeking for, but seek ye first. You and I have to be seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all those other things, he'll add them unto us. Maybe we won't be eating high on the hog like they are. They have the bigger cars and the nicer houses and the nicer salaries and all that stuff. But we'll be fulfilling the will of God. That's what Jesus said was his meat, was to fulfill the will of him that sent him, to finish his work. How many souls has God brought to Christ through you? And if he's brought a few, praise God. You've multiplied yourself. The church won't die. But if you haven't even brought one, we can't expect the church to grow. If we haven't got two, the church will grow if we dig it two. If we get a bunch, we'll see the church really multiply like Jesus wanted it to. He wanted it to spread to the whole world. He wanted us to get the gospel to the whole world. Remember then those 12? It says, these that turned the world upside down have come hither also. They were pretty serious about getting the gospel out. And when there was persecution, that might be what it takes in America, when there was persecution happened, then they went everywhere preaching the gospel. But right now, these are pretty soft. And every Sunday we get to come and hear something interesting. And we get to go home and come back the next week. What do we do with what we heard? Did we apply it during the week? Did we get out there and do something with it? Did it change anything? Did it change us? That's what it's for. That's what the Word of God is. It's supposed to, it's, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and it's profitable. Profitable for instruction. I think that's what it says, right? And for, I can't remember in English. What's it say? Doctrine. Doctrine, okay. Doctrine to teach us. And then for instruction. And then for reproof. And then for correction. And then for instruction, right? Okay. I can't remember them in English. Okay, first God wants to teach you doctrine so you know what you should believe and should be doing. If you're not doing what you should be when he told you, what he instructed you in the doctrine, then he's going to reprove you that you're not doing right so that he can correct you, get you on the right path, and then instruct you in righteousness how to serve him, what to do further. But God wants us to be instructed so we can do what we're here for. Are you and I doing what we're here for? Or are you just getting instructed or reproved every week for not doing it? I mean, let's get serious. We're in his school. We're disciples. He's teaching us. He's teaching us to be obedient like Jesus was. And do the will of the Father, the one that's... And Jesus said, I want you to go now, too. He said, I'm going to go with you because I want to speak to those people. When you read 2 Corinthians 5, verse 20, when God tells us your identity, my identity... We're not just people living down here. We're who? Ambassadors. You know what an ambassador is? When the people ask me in Ukraine, how can I get to America? I said, well, I'm not really an ambassador. I can't tell you. And not everybody that goes to the embassy, do they want to come to America? So they try to screen them and say, okay, you can't go. You can. But God wants everybody in heaven, doesn't he? And we don't have to make it hard. We don't have to screen them. We just have to tell them how they can get there. But we got to be the ones that realize that's my job. That's what I'm here for. So that other people can get to heaven. I'm an ambassador. I'm here to represent heaven down here to be able to help those people out there understand how they can get up there if they believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Repent and believe. And if they will have that day when they finally, like I did, when they finally realize, oh, I'm like a sheep. I went so far away. God, I'm going to die in my sins. God, and we repent. Godly sorrow works that repentance. Unto salvation, we come to him and ask him to forgive us. When we admit we're guilty and Jesus died for our sins, you know what that Savior says? Hey, I'm your advocate. I can help you. I can make sure you get what I died for. 
He died and he's up there right now resurrected to be able to make sure that everything that is in that covenant, that new covenant, that new testament, is given to those that are the beneficiaries of that covenant. And you and I are beneficiaries. But you know what we do? We just keep coming to the throne of grace to get mercy and grace to help in time of need. We don't realize those sinners need to get up there too. And he says that we, the little children, these things have I written unto you. Second Corinthians, it's Second John verse 1. My little children, these things write I unto you that you sin not. But if any man sin, if, it doesn't mean we have to, but if, then we have an advocate. Jesus Christ the righteous. And he is the propitiation for our sins, not for our sins only, but for the sins of the whole world. And he's sitting up there to intercede for those sinners too. We got to get them up there, not just come ourselves. What do you get when you get there? Mercy. Amen. At the mercy seat. Amen. Why? Two weeks ago or so, you guys celebrated the resurrection, right? Yes. Christ did what? He rose, went up to heaven, and sprinkled that blood right before that mercy seat. So each and every one of us could come and get mercy. Read the Old Testament. God says he's a merciful God. He's plenteous. He's got, he loves man, but he's merciful. He wants to forgive. But you know what that sacrifice at the cross did? That made the way for forgiveness. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. But now there is remission. Because of shedding of blood. His blood was shed. His blood is there. It's a guarantee. When anybody comes to Christ... To God through Christ, they get salvation. They come sincerely. But we got to get them there. Amen? Let's get serious about doing our job, getting them to Christ. That's what we're here for. God wants to use you in a mighty way. If you haven't already led somebody to Christ, ask Brother Randy, help me. Do a class on soul winning. Teach me how. You know, he'd be happy to. I'm, I'm 100% sure of that. Every pastor would love to see somebody who says, I really want to do this. He'd say, well, praise God. And let's get the rest of them serious about it, too. I hope it wouldn't be just one of you. I hope you really want to. If you already know and you're rusty, get out there and do it again. And don't be afraid of their revilings. Don't be afraid of what they're going to say or how they're going to look at you. I, I tell people this over there in Ukraine all the time. I'd rather offend you now than have you be mad at me at later. And I'm not going to offend you with some lies. I'm going to offend you with the truth, maybe. But I'm going to tell you the truth, because you've got to know the bad news so the good news sounds like it is good. You have to know how lost you are so you realize how saved you can become through the Savior. Amen. Brother Randy, thank you, Lord, for your church. Thank you for praying for us. Thank you for praying for us while we're there right now. I'm going back in June, Lord willing, and we're going to... Try to relocate probably to a city that's not being bombed all the time. But we're praying about where because right now most Ukrainians don't want us to speak Russian anymore. We learned Russian. That's, what, that's the language of, of Odessa. It's a trade city, trade language. But now we're going to be moving and working with all the refugees and all the churches that all want to speak Ukrainian. So I know and understand a lot of it, but I can't speak it yet. I, mean, I, can, I can butcher it. But I really want to get some real... We're, we already talked to some people over there, and we're going to try to get a university teacher to teach us so we can actually speak it right. And that's what we did the first time we got over there. Brother Rue, myself, and my partner, Paul Gray, we all went to the university and learned, learned Russian, right, so we could speak to them grammatically proper. But now we've got to learn Ukrainian. So pray for us about that, if you would, and pray that God will continue working there in Ukraine. But I'm praying God will work right here in Canton. Praying he'll use you. Praying you'll get serious about your calling. Not mine only, but yours. You know, I'm on a mission, but are you on a mission too? Jesus was, and we all should be. Let's go ahead and sing that song that I have decided to follow Jesus, and we'll make a commitment. We'll think about that, our choices for God. Altar's open if you want to come up here and pray and say, God, I need to be a better witness. God, give me open doors. God, give me divine appointments. Show me what they are. Stand up together as we sing this, this song. I make a decision. Isn't that, it's really a great thought that people choose what they do based on what they know, which is why pretty much most of them Muslim kids will become Muslims because that's everything they know. 
from their parents and their culture. And so we need to inform people of another option, right? And then they can make a choice on the greatest, greatest news in the world, the gospel of Jesus Christ. What song, if you need it, number? 635. 635, if you need the book. Pray to your God. God, I want to be a better witness. God, I, want, I have lost loved ones. I need to be saved. Or I need to see saved. And let's, let's do some prayer for them. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. The world behind me, the cross before me. The world behind me, the cross before me. The world behind me, the cross before me. No turning back. As Marcella plays a verse of it or two, let's just pray and maybe ask God to put someone on your heart, on your soul. Maybe you have a loved one that you need to pray for even now. Maybe you could be the answer to someone else's prayer that's praying for their loved one, that way they'd get a witness. Jesus said, if you, you said, I want to follow Jesus. He said, if you follow me, I'll make you what? Yeah, that's what he said. So I guess it kind of shows how close we're following him, doesn't it? Here's what we want to do. We're, we'll close our service, and if you need to go and want to go, that's fine. And then we need to get the children home on the bus and, and other things. But if you want to stay, Brother Rue, I'm going to have you come up here and answer some questions. If people want to ask some. So we'll close our service in a word of prayer, and then you can be dismissed, maybe uh, uh, Sister Roxana, you can be at the table and talk to people back there as they come out or something, the ones that are leaving, and then we'll have Brother Rue come up. And if you have some questions, maybe you have a question or someone else has one that you said, oh, yeah, that would have been a good one for me to know about, and missions, Ukraine, things. We'll close our service like that. Sound good? All right, sounds good to a couple of us. Let's give a closing prayer then. And Brother Aaron Furman, would you give us a closing prayer, please? God, this morning, Lord, for your word, Lord, and for your, your spirit that uh, definitely pokes and prods at us, and uh, Lord, we're, we're so thankful for the servant of God that you sent our way here this morning to encourage us, Lord, to, uh, to get our eyes upon heaven and look down towards earth and, and see people the way that you see them. They're lost, and, and Lord, they're on the way to hell, and uh, Lord, we have the answer. We've got the gospel. We've got the truth, and uh, Lord, we, we have burdened, and may we go forth weeping and bearing precious seeds, Lord, and we may see them, doubtless, come again. And so, Lord, we ask you to do that, and we ask you to use us in that way, and we'll thank you for it in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. God bless you. You're dismissed, unless you're not. If you want to stay, we'll ask some questions here in a minute.